Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I am here with the beauty thief herself. It's Xanthi! What's Yay! up, Xanthi? <laughs> thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks I for having me. I wore my Morgana shirt just for you. Oh my gosh, that's adorable. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't have any Haru merch at all, sadly. That's okay, there's not a lot of it. <laughs> oh, I but, have... Does, does Haru have, like, a, a Funko Pop? No, not that I know of. I have, like, um, her Nendroid and another figure. Oh, that's of her. cool. But, um, yeah, at least there's those. So I was really excited, and I, like, pre-ordered way ahead of time and forgot about them. And then a year later when they showed up, I was like, yes! <laughs> I love when that happens, especially, like, during this pandemic. I feel like the mail has become such an important part of my day. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, oh, presents, delivered. or just a, an excuse to go to the mailbox. <laughs> yeah. It's been very exciting around here, as you can tell. Not really. <laughs> Mail time, yes. Yeah. How has your quarantine pandemic experience been? Mm, I've been, I've been all right. Um, okay. I guess I was already kind of a homebody, so mm -hmm. being forced to stay home wasn't that much of a change. Cool. It was just a little different to talk to everybody over over Zoom like this and stuff. So mm -hmm. that was just an adjustment. Yeah, for sure. Same. I feel like I've kind of like settled into it now. <laughs> I got like Zoom um Zoom fatigue in the beginning. Yeah. Cause I was trying to like FaceTime and like zoom with everybody. And then I was like, Oh, I can't like stare at a screen anymore. But now I feel like I'm back into it. <laughs> like I don't mind as much. <laughs> anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, so I asked a bunch of the followers on my YouTube channel and on Twitter for some questions for you. And a bunch of people wrote in. Ooh. So, um, I'm just going to go down the line and we can have a little combo. Cool. cool. So, um, now, uh, I don't know how to say your name. I'm sorry. Naoko, Tai, and a bunch of other people wanted to know how you got the role of Haru. So uh, I think it may be different than a lot of the other actors, but I was just called in. Like, I didn't audition. Um, yeah. And I came and they were like, oh, we just have a game that we'd like you to work on. Can you come mm -hmm. in? And I came in and they had me sign all the paperwork. And then they were like, so, by the way, we're working on Persona 5. I was like, oh. <laughs> and then, you know, they filled me in with the storyline and the character and showed me artwork. And they said, you cannot talk about her ever, ever, ever. And Aww. I was like, even when it comes out? And they were like, maybe not even then. She's still, uh, at the time, they said she, I don't think there was much information even out for her in Japan yet. Oh, so they okay. were like, you cannot ever talk about this wow. at all. Yeah. That's crazy. So had you worked with Atlas or uh, PCB? PCB is a studio where we, where we recorded everything. Um, had you worked with them before and that's how they got your name? I think so. I, um, a little bit before that, maybe a couple months before that, I came in to do just like um, incidental voices for um, – Shin Megami Tensei 4. Cool. And, uh, that was for Atlas. And I think it was also the same um, director, producer. And, like, mm -hmm. um, that may have been how he, like, cast me. <laughs> Probably. So that may have been my audition, so nice. to speak. Yeah, I mean, that happens sometimes where, like, you know, we'll work with a producer or a director and then another project will come right up and they'll be like, oh, I just worked with that actor and they would be perfect for this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, getting direct cast is really, really nice when it happens. Yeah, you always gotta um, put your best foot forward even if it's for small bits. Exactly, yeah, that is so important like for people just starting out or you know, just in general. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as a small part, only small actors. It's like yeah. such an old quote, but it's so true. Because, like, if you kill it doing incidental, in, incidental characters one day, like, you could be called back for a lead. So, yeah. yeah that was the case for me, I think. <laughs> nice. It's kind of, kind of a similar story for me. I, so the producer on this game, he had heard me voice Kyubei from Madoka Magica. 
place. And that's why I was called in to audition. But I had worked at PCB before, but I definitely like auditioned and we like played with a bunch of different voices because like he liked Cube, but then didn't want Morgana to sound exactly like Cube, like for obvious reasons. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of how I got my role. That's, that's so cool. cool. Yeah. All right. So I'm just wondering what order to ask you these. I'm just going to go for it. Okay. Dellen Sedano wants to know, how is it like voice acting a character with social anxiety? Oh. Um. Hmm. I guess I feel like this relates more with uh, my character in Fire Emblem Three Houses because mm-hmm. she definitely has that quite a bit. Mm. Um, really reclusive. And I kind of get that myself. So I, can, I re- really relate with that <laughs> and a lot of characters that, I, that have that. And um, it gets, it, it does, it feels uncomfortable because the character is uncomfortable <laughs> mm-hmm. in a way it's kind of method. But yeah. I think it really, um, I'm really dependent on the safe space that the studios create and the director mm-hmm. that I'm working with to feel um, um, safe enough to go to those vulnerable places um when playing those kind of characters yeah Mm -hmm. I mean acting in itself is just being like super vulnerable and super like raw and open Mm -hmm. so it's really important that we do have such a safe space to do that yeah especially at PCB like they always make you feel so comfortable like they're very like family oriented Mm -hmm. and they're just like so welcoming and anything you need like they have there and they take care of you so yeah, especially yeah. Val. I love Val. I know she's, Val's great. She's like my mom. Aww. Yeah, and I feel like she does a good job of like, or she Val was the director, by the way. She did a good job of like translating what the producer wanted out of us, because I feel like sometimes producers don't really speak actor the way a director does. So yeah. like, part of the director's role is to like translate the producer words into something that is like actor friendly or like actor understood like right away Mm -hmm. so yeah we love that one um do you relate to haru at all this is from the galaxy god and panda pal gaming this was a popular question yeah i i I think um in the sense that she tries really hard to be polite and um you know, just always present, um, when around other people and like willing to listen to them. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely feel like that's, that's like a bit of like who I am. A lot of, yeah, Haru, I feel like a lot of times I was just kind of playing me except a little bit more dainty. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like that. And I, I like to tease too. And I think that she definitely has that kind of, um, playful side that mm-hmm. people kind of interpret as like slightly sadistic. I don't think I am, but <laughs> but I think in a teasing, um, from a teasing standpoint, I think that's oh, like fun and like something I relate with. Yeah, she's like very playful. Mm-hmm. I love that she's beauty thief. I don't even know the story behind that. Why does she call herself that? Morgana called her that first. <laughs> he was like, you know, like this, this beauty thief. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I don't even remember that part of it. That's so embarrassing. But I mean, we did record that. What, how many years ago? It was in the, it was in the anime too. Oh, see, like, like when Morgana runs away and then he's trying to be like, uh, trying to use Haru to kind of stick it to the other guys be like, oh yeah, I remember to say these things about them. And so she, like, <laughs> um, I remember it. That's a cute scene. Mm-hmm. It's a great scene. I remember when the way they directed me was um, think of it as Sailor Moon's like first introduction, like, you know, like I'm going to show you all of you. And mm-hmm. so I was like, okay, so it's slightly awkward, but like kind of showy and dramatic, but um, you're not really sure what's going on and you're just following Morgana's lead. I'm like, all right. <laughs> nice. I think you nailed it for sure. Now I do remember that from the anime. It's hard because like, sometimes so we recorded persona 5 like the original one like what four yes four years ago now 
Yeah. A and lot it was spread out over then. like a year, I feel like. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it was a lot of recording, a lot of sessions. It was like super spread out. And then we had to wait for it to come out. So then like in the meantime, like we record all of this other stuff. Yeah, it's hard to like keep it all, uh, keep it, uh, remember all of it just because there's so much going on and then all the different like reactions that you might have to like certain things that are going on be- depending on what the player chooses. Mm-hmm. And then, so it's hard to remember like specific moments unless you see them again, I feel okay. like. Like when I played the game, then I was like, okay, at the time I didn't really have a full sense of the story, but now that I'm playing the game, I get it because we're only voicing certain moments in between what's going on. Yeah, exactly. And we're only voicing our characters' moments. Yeah. So we don't get to see, like, the whole picture unless we sit down and play it or watch somebody play it on YouTube. <laughs> it's a long game. game. <laughs> I know. there. It's, like, such a long game. I think I played, like, eight hours of Persona 5, and then, like, that was it. I haven't played anything more than that. But I've watched other people play. Mm-hmm who are much better gamers than I am. <laughs> Not a good gamer at all. Same. I'm pretty slow at it too. I think it took me probably like a year to finally get through all of it. It's like the only JRPG that I finished because JRPGs are so, so long. <laughs> yeah, they really are. But I think it's cool because like people are really getting like their money's worth. Mm-hmm. And it's like providing like a whole experience where it's like, I don't know, like, you watch a movie, like, oh, cool, you have, like, 90 minutes to two hours of something, and then you're, like, done. But yeah. in a JRPG, you're, like, fully immersed in this world for, like, days or weeks or months. And there's usually a movie in there, too, so it's, like, a full experience. Yeah, it's really different than watching the anime, I feel like, just because you're going around, you're making the choices, whereas in it, something like the anime, like, choices are made just to, for the flow of things. yeah. Yeah, I never thought of it like that, actually, but you're totally right. The way we dubbed the anime was really different than usual dubbing, too. When we didn't really see the picture, it was just, uh, it was like recording for the game, really. Yeah. Yeah, so for people watching, the difference was usually when we dub an anime, like, we preview sometimes the whole scene, sometimes just the line, and then we go in and dub that one line, and then we stop. And... It's kind of, it can be like a tedious process. Like sometimes I find it like really tedious because I will just want to like do a whole scene, mm-hmm. but you know, we can't because we have to match the lip flaps. For the anime, for the, or the Persona 5 anime, instead of matching lip flaps, they did it so we matched timing instead. So it was just like line, 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 line. And we didn't even really like preview at first. Although after a while, I was like, I want to preview. And then they would like let me as we as the recording went on. Did you ever get to preview or no? I did for um, just to hear it so I can know what the timing is. Otherwise, I'm like, I'm not sure what I'm doing, <laughs> what's yeah. happening. I know the basic storyline of, of Persona 5. But at the same time, it's like when you're jumping moment to moment, I'm like, I don't remember the order of things anymore. Where, yeah. where are we? What's happening? Yeah. It came out good, though. <laughs> Yeah, it came out amazing. I yeah. I wasn't sure because I, you know, because while we were, while we were dubbing, we couldn't see it, so I, I wasn't sure how things were matching to expression and things like that, whatever is going on. But mm-hmm. it turned out really great. Yeah, they did a really <laughs> good job, awesome. and that's thanks. I mean, obviously us, we did a great job. <laughs> <I know. laughs> the actors were amazing, but um, no, it was like a lot of the studio they they have this new method and they were able to make it look and sound really good. So Mm -hmm. thanks guys. (laughs) PCB. Yeah, PCB. He's like joining (gasps) me right now. He loves Zoom calls. He just wants to like sit in my lap. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect for this cold weather. Yeah, for sure. He's like extra, extra puffy right now (laughs) because it's been so cold. He like puffs himself up. Oh, yeah, you're so funny. Um, okay, let's go back to the questions. Um, <laughs> let's see. Oh, this kind of relates to what we were talking about. Sven wants to know, is it difficult to get back into a character? 
after not playing them for a long time? And are there specific things you do to get back into character? Um, I mean, I, you know, for most of our sessions, we have a vocal ref, usually that the studio pulls up that you listen to, and then maybe they'll play a line and then you can repeat it just to like kind of get back in this, the voice and the headspace of the character. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I just kind of go from there. I think sometimes I'll like, like to prep before I go into a session, I'll just listen to my old audition or something like that. If I have it. Yeah. That's actually a really good way to get back into character is to like listen to the original audition because it's like the original choices that you made that like made them cast you. But in the case of Haru, you didn't even have an audition. So <laughs> I don't want to work for that. I feel like at this point, like after the second Persona game, every time I get to play Morgana again, it feels like I'm hanging out with an old friend. Yeah. Yeah. So at this point, I would say it's not that difficult to get back into character. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, nailing the voice. But again, we have the voice reference for that. So Yeah. We've done so many now, too. I'm, I'm really, I, f I think we're really fortunate that, you know, it's been so successful and been able to, like, spin off into these other games. I know. Like, I really liked working on the, the dancing game a lot because there's so much dialogue in between the characters and you get to know them a bit more and, like, their relationships with each other as they're talking. Because mm -hmm. I feel like in the game, sometimes, like, they don't get to, you don't get to see them talking to each other that much as opposed to, like, talking to Joker or planning things and things like that. Yeah. It's, like, I didn't know, I knew about, okay, I had, like, a small role in Persona 4, the anime, but I wasn't that familiar with the games, and I didn't know that it had, like, a rabid cult following. <laughs> so, like, I didn't know that this was going to be so big. I don't know if anybody did, though. I didn't either. I didn't really, I, I didn't, couldn't really, um... I didn't understand the, how big it was until that panel at Anime Expo. Oh when we got stage, I was like, this is so much more than I thought. Because <laughs> you can't really tell online with like right. interactions with fans. But yeah, stepping into that room made me go like, whoa. <laughs> yeah, that was intense. That was like walking into that room. So it's a huge panel. It's the biggest panel room at Anime Expo. It holds like two or 3,000 people. And it was full from front to back. And everybody was just, like, cheering and screaming and, like, just... Had so many signs and, like, there was yeah. a lot of cosplay. There was... <laughs> I'll always remember it forever. The, the random fan that had the giant cardboard cutouts of all our faces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were all, like, the most ridiculous, like, expressions, too. <laughs> holding them up as we like came on stage <laughs> that was nuts somebody also had like a morgana cardboard bus yeah was that was nice. so cool oh my god i loved that so much <laughs> <laughs> seriously like i felt like a rock star that day like walking onto that stage and just having everyone be like, like <laughs> we love you i was like wow <laughs> that was definitely one of the coolest moments of my life <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. It's funny because, like, we record things solo, like, in such an insular environment. And especially now, like, with quarantine, like, we're recording at home. So it's, like, even more insular. So yeah. it's, yeah, it, we, it's hard to grasp, like, how many people it's going to reach, who they are, how they feel about it. It's nuts. <laughs> that was also the first time I met a lot of the other actors in Persona with us. I, I can't believe they got all of us. I know. Um, but yeah, it was kind of, it was really cool. Nice. Very memorable. <laughs> you had the cutest cosplay too. Like you looked so good. Yeah. I had planned to change out of it. I, I, I was wearing it all day and I was thinking of like changing out because I was like, I don't want to be the only one in costume while everybody else is like professional looking and themselves. And I didn't have time. And I was like, okay, my hair is a mess under this wig. So I'm just, I'm just going to go as is. 
<laughs> I'm gonna be the biggest dork on stage. But oh, no, I thought you looked so cute. I was like, damn, she's a good cosplayer. <laughs> oh. I was like, oh, I hope they let me back in, like in, in backstage, because I don't want, I don't want them to, to think I'm just somebody's trying to sneak in. <laughs> oh my god, you're like, I swear, I'm, I'm the voice of Haru, and they're like, <laughs> what? They're like, no, you're cosplay. <laughs> Oh my god. No, we would have vouched for you. We know. <laughs> we can you. tell from your voice. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, oh, this is a good one from James McElroy. What did you think about Haru's confidant events and romance route? Oh, they were great. I think um, there were some fun scenes, like when she takes... Um, takes Joker out for like uh, to the cafe to try out some expensive like coffee beans because she's thinking about opening her own place or something like that and um, mm. uh, I don't know if, sorry if this is a spoiler but I think it's really funny and the game's been out for a while but okay, it's, it's they, already uh, out it's fine it's like what do you think of this coffee and then she tells him oh it's made from like um, civet poop and she and he goes like <laughs> this reaction because that, that coffee is a delicacy in other countries, and it's really, really, really expensive. And that only Haru could afford, really. Um, but I know that's... I liked moments like that where um, they got to go and just do, like, everyday things like shopping and hanging out and things like that. And um, obviously, if you couldn't tell, I, I romanced Haru in the game <laughs> just because I wanted to hear how the scenes turned out. Yeah. But... Um, but they were, they were really sweet. And, um, and then I went on YouTube and watched the other routes that I didn't go through <laughs> just to see how everybody else, um, how, how everybody else did. But yeah, I, I like, I like them a lot. They were fun. Nice. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> so Haru likes cooking and gardening, right? Um, I know she, she does like gardening for sure. Okay. Cooking, I'm not sure. I don't think there's too much of that. Okay. Are <laughs> you so in- rich? I don't know if she does cook. Yeah, she's like, I just have somebody do it for me. <laughs> right. um, are you into gardening and food and stuff like that? Like, do you relate to her in that way? Mm, I do like um, fancy teas and coffee when I can, but I, I, I like to cook, but I'm not really a gardener. Um, things will thrive for a little while, but most of the times I'll forget. And then when I go back, they're like dead. Yeah. So. Yeah, I've done that. <laughs> it's hard. It is hard. The only thing that is really thriving in my house right now are my snake plants. Mm-hmm. And it's because they require so little attention. <laughs> like they need very low light. They need like very little water. So, if you want a snake plant, I don't think it will die on you because it's pretty much impossible to kill. <laughs> <laughs> I will look into that. That sounds good. Yeah, I only have one plant that's still surviving, and I've had it for about a year now, and it's like an orchid, because um, oh, I didn't wow. know that, you know, after, like, the flower, um, it, you know, it's done with its season, that, you know, you can still take care of the leaves that are there, and then one day it'll flower again. Uh, so I've been just taking care of it, and really, it takes very little water. It likes indirect sunlight, so I can mm-hmm. just leave it on my desk. And then when I remember to water it, then I'll water it. Nice. Yeah, you would do well with a snake plant then. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, I didn't know that that was the experience with orchids. Yeah, I thought that after the flower was dead, then the plant's was done. done. But- yeah. That's what I thought, too. Like, I've been given orchids. I guess I threw them out after their flowers (laughs) fell off. I didn't know there was more. (laughs) Sorry, orchids. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. All right. This was actually my favorite question that was sent in by Matt Sandwich. And he said, how would you describe your experience as a woman in the games and anime voice acting industry? What do you think the voice acting slash game slash anime industry could do differently to empower women as well as other minorities? Wow. Yeah. Deep question. Couple parts to it. So 
Um, I don't even know where to begin. I think um, this year in particular, a lot of attention has been on the BLM movement and that has really uh, um, had a profound impact on the voiceover community as well in that um, um, not only actors, but like director, casting directors uh, and, and like studios and production studios are um, putting more of a focus on casting authentically mm -hmm. or trying to reach out and like update their casting rosters so that they can have um, POC actors and um, actors of all different uh, genders um, audition for, you know, character specific roles. Um, so I think that's been um, really great that, you know, there's been attention placed on that and like they're actively trying to be more authentic about that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, Hmm. Other than that, I think also um, actors like advocating when they see auditions, they can, you know, feel like they can reach out to the casting director and be like, hey, can I recommend somebody? I think already voiceover um, people are really great about that, about yeah. recommending other actors and friends that they know are really good and like maybe suitable for certain parts. Mm -hmm. But even more so now when, you know, when casting is looking for something very, very specific. Um, yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts? So I feel like, so we always hear, and this is very true, that like women make like something like 70 cents on the dollar of what like men make mm -hmm. overall, like in the U.S. And like, that's very, very true. Um, in voiceover, I would like to think, although I don't know because I've never gone up to like a guy and been like, so like, what's your paycheck? Um, but there are like established rates, you know, like through our union and there's just industry standards that that's, that's what we get paid. So in that sense, if everybody's getting like the, the minimum, then everybody's getting paid equally, which I think is good because it is hard as an actor to like advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. um, you know, payment wise. So that's one of the reasons why I like having a union because they're like, no, this is the minimum that everybody should be getting. Um, so in that respect, I think it's been good. I'm really glad that um, uh, CODA was created to just also create awareness for a lot of actors um, mm -hmm. because um, maybe if they're just starting out and such, they don't know what the established rates should be or when studios are maybe being vague about what their rates are going to be for certain projects uh, and um, I think it's really nice to have a community to kind of back you up or just a place to safely ask if you're unsure just so that you can get an opinion before maybe responding or asking or advocating for yourself. It is really scary because you don't want to yeah. be like, oh, I don't want to like step on toes and such like that. Yeah. Or like being blacklisted from a studio and such. Yeah. But it's nice to have um, something established like that out there and like having um, that as a resource, like a website to go to and just kind of look that up. Yeah. So for people that are watching that don't know, CODA is Coalition of Dubbing Actors, which was a group that formed in order to empower actors and educate actors in the dubbing and anime and JRPG space on, you know, working conditions. And a lot of that has to do with rates. So yeah, I think like as a community, we are trying to move forward with, you know, having people get paid what what their time is worth and equally and stuff like that so i guess coda has been a good a good way to empower people and you know mm -hmm. women to ask for what they're worth so that's been good yeah um i also think especially like i feel like anime and jrpgs have provided a lot of opportunities for female actors just because like there are a lot of female roles in anime and JRPGs that maybe like something 
I'm trying to think of like a really popular like Western video game, like Call of Duty. Like that's like very like male heavy, but in the Japanese things, like there's a lot of female voices, right? Yeah. There's also, there's like a wide variety of different female types too. Like they're different True. tropes. Like you have like, even if it was like a military, like anime or anime, like JRPG, mm-hmm. you can have like, a cute little girl yeah. in the army or something like that next to like a femme fatale like badass mm-hmm. that is so true whereas like in stuff that it's made in the u.s like you would never yeah <laughs> like, like i, I, I would sound be like ridiculous a <laughs> yeah so i feel like that's one of the reasons why like I kind of gravitated towards this space in my voice acting career because like there were more roles available. I mean, I sound really young. I have a high voice. So, you know, it's kind of like a natural, a natural progression, I guess. Yeah. And a lot of the storylines too, aren't just, they're not like geared toward children, like, like, like um, Western animation might be. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of it has like, there's all sorts of different genres in within anime, but yeah, a lot of it can be very heartfelt, very moving, mm-hmm. or, you know, also very gory, <laughs> if you want to yeah. go in that way, so. Yeah, there's so definitely, much. there's definitely way more, there's like, more options for us mm-hmm. in anime, which is really interesting. <laughs> yeah, because like, the stuff that I work on, like the Western stuff is all like the animation stuff is all geared towards children because I'm like playing a child it's for children which you know I like Same. but it's just different in anime and JRPGs mm-hmm. crazy uh thanks for the question Matt <laughs> we like that one <laughs> oh man okay Let's see, what else have I got for you? Oh, here's, here's, I'm sure you've been asked this a million times, but people are always curious. AJ Angelus, what inspired you to become a voice actor? Hmm, well, I was, um, I was acting in theater, and, um, I also had, like, a big love for anime at the time. It was, like, during, like, the big boom of it, and, um, Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think I was watching something and it suddenly clicked in my mind that, you know, this is actually like a job for somebody. I wonder how I can get that job, you know, like, um, you know, like, I, would, I don't really agree with the casting choice for this character's voice. I feel like maybe I could have done it. Cool. Um, and I was talking to a friend of mine during rehearsals that day, and she happened to tell me. Uh, that there was like an acting co- voice acting competition at anime expo mm-hmm. and that's basically like I, I looked it up and i signed up and i competed and that's kind of like how i got into it oh wow it's crazy that it happened like like the same day that i had that thought that i asked a friend and then i like it just like you know like snowballed into that wow um, but before that i didn't realize that this could be a job yeah I don't know. It just seemed something very prestigious and like you have to know somebody to get into it. And it's like, how do I, how do I get into it? How do I break in? Yeah. (laughs) There is no one way to break in. Right. Everybody has a different story. Mm -hmm. I think that's That's really cool. Like when you ask people how they get in, it's just like, you know, it's like, I I didn't even know you could do that. (laughs) Yeah. When I first started acting, Oh my god. Like I did local theater and stuff, but I I lived close to New York City, so I wanted to be like an on-camera actor. I wanted to do like commercials and sitcoms and stuff like that. And back then, like voice actor wasn't like a thing that I I didn't even know it was a thing. Like, I thought, like, yeah, you could be an actor. Like, you could be a Broadway actor. You could be a TV actor. You could be a film actor. But nobody ever talked about being a voice actor. Now it's, like, a known thing. Yeah. And I think that's our fault. (laughs) (laughs) But, like, 
a whole generation of people now have grown up like going to conventions or like watching YouTube videos or listening to podcasts about, you know, about voice actors or that are put on by voice actors. So now, now people are like, yes, I only want to do voice, but you know, a lot of people are like, I want to do theater and TV and this and that. So I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. There's, yeah, you could start like in any of those arenas, like we did like with theater and then like transition over Mm -hmm. or some people just like start training solely in voice. But I mean, I feel like our background makes it easier to transition into voice acting because you have that experience of like acting with your full range of motion and Mm -hmm. then trying to, you know, like compress that into only like translating through your voice. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of theater actors become really successful voice actors. I think, like, there's just something about it. (laughs) Maybe because, like, when you're on stage, like, I was always told, like, act for the last row. So, I don't know, something about that. It always stuck with me, and I, like, I don't know, I, like, carry it with me to this day. (laughs) There's definitely, like like caricatures, like if you do like Commedia dell'arte that mm-hmm. are like really big and grand and that translates well, especially for like, for animation mm-hmm. versus like if you were an on-camera actor, I feel uh, from my experience with like on-camera actors trying to like transition to voiceover, it's a little bit different because you act um, so much more subtly. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's like your, your facial expressions and yeah. that doesn't translate through your voice if you're being so subtle. Right. Yeah. I think at this point I would need some serious training if I was going to go back to doing on-camera stuff. <laughs> because like, whenever I'm doing voiceover, I make like the weirdest faces. <laughs> when I talk, I'm just like very expressive, but like voiceover, I'm like, ah, or like, eh, like, you know, to like get it across. Yeah. So. I'm yeah. really bodily awkward. Like <laughs> that kind of stuff. I'm so used to being planted in one place that it's just like, I don't know, unless they tell me like, you need to hit that mark, I can walk over to there, but then just like, I don't know what to do with my hands. (laughs) Hey, (laughs) what's up? (laughs) Very natural, right? (laughs) Totally, that looked natural, right? (laughs) How's this? (laughs) Oh my god, we're so weird. It's fine. <laughs> Nobody That's can see us when we're acting anyway. <laughs> it's okay. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, just a couple random questions and we'll wrap it up. All right. Um, did you have any childhood crushes for TV shows, movies, or anime? This is from Mystic. Oh. Um, certainly. Uh, I think one of my earliest crushes would be Tuxedo Mask from Sailor Moon. <laughs> but now looking at it from an adult perspective, I'm like, he literally does nothing but show up and just be like, you can do it. Bye. <laughs> You're just like, like someone that motivates you. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, That's really cute. Yeah. I, think- I, don't know, I don't know if I had any like cartoon crushes. Oh, I did love Joseph Gordon-Levitt, though, on Third Rock from the Sun, and I love him to this day. He's just so cute. Yes. He has, like, his little long hair. Adorable. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Ryan Holter wants to know, what's your go-to hype music? Go-to hype music? Oh. Like, if you want to get pumped up. Um, well, I always listen to, well, part of my, um, voiceover warm-up ritual i guess is uh my chemical romance yes is, um it's like a lot of loud exaggerated like you know like shout singing yeah and i feel like that's really great for my articulators nice so for me that that's like my hype music going into the booth <laughs> hell yeah i love that i feel like my so i love like any rock music any like pop punk emo is like my Mm -hmm. favorite favorite but I don't know if that's like totally good for like hyping yourself up because a lot of it is depressing (laughs) 
But um, there's this random, random band called Wolfpack. Maybe I shouldn't call them random. They're amazing. But they're like a jam band, and they, I don't know. I can't even, like, describe it. There must be, like, 20 people in this band, and, like, every song sounds like just, it's all over the place. That's, like, really fun for me to listen to because it always makes me want to dance. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if, like, I'm in the car going to a session, I'll pop that on. <laughs> Yeah, that definitely sounds like hype music. Yeah, it's fun. It makes me want to go <laughs> like this. <laughs> um, oh, Andrew Siv- Sivinskas. Sorry, I'm like butchering people's names. Um, do you have any books, TV shows, video games, etc., that you consider to be essential to take your mind off of COVID slash the world? <laughs> oh, wow. Um, or that you've just been enjoying during this year? Ah, <sighs> trying to think. What if I, I've binged so much, and like I feel like it's a problem yeah. when I binge something. It just, I don't retain as much as of it as I would if I were to like slowly like enjoy it. Yeah, but um, I guess to like list some things that come to mind. I mean, like uh, as far as like just general favorites, maybe not just like things I've watched this year. Uh huh. Um, like one of my favorite movies of all time is uh Hugo. That's I think that's still on Netflix. Cool. I don't think it's like a beautiful it. like um beautiful film, and it like talks about like the um, like early cinema too. Mm-hmm. Um, cinema creator, and yeah. Uh, cool. I should read more books. I haven't been reading much this year, even though I had all the time. Mm. But I was rereading uh, Count of Monte Cristo because I remember really liking that a lot in high school. And I was like, I wanted to revisit because I don't remember particulars anymore. Cool. That's nice. It's such a good time to, like, delve into, like, a huge sweeping novel like that. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like I've been watching all of, like, the popular TV shows that, like, everybody's talking about this year. Like, The Queen's Gambit. Oh, I need to start that. I loved it so much. Oh, I was, like, sad when it was over. It was so good. You should definitely watch it. Um, I just started watching The Flight Attendant yesterday on HBO Max. That is really good. It's, like, a murder mystery. And it's, like, I have no idea where it's going. And I just love shows like that. Mm -hmm. And then in the beginning of the year, I watched Cheer. And that was, like, oh, I just loved Cheer so much. I just love, like, underdog stories. They're, like, rooting for people that, oh. And then they make it, and you feel so happy for them. <laughs> and, of course, Tiger King. Like, I need a second season of Tiger King. <laughs> now, talking about it now, it feels like it was five years ago, but I was thinking about that. I was like, wow, I was, like, really into Tiger King in March. Oh, that was earlier this year. I haven't really watched it because, like, I wasn't sure if I would like it. So I was just like, ah, I'm going to hold off and watch it later, and I haven't gotten mm-hmm. to it yet. It's insane. Um, I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> if you just, just want to think about nothing else, it's definitely like an escapist type of thing. And then you just like think about these other people's lives, and you're like, oh my god, like these my people exist. So, yeah, they, like they exist. Like, my life is so different from this, from everybody in the show. I can relate to one person there, but that's why it was fascinating. So. Yeah. Um, book wise, let's see. I have like a a pile of books. I feel like I've started a lot of stuff and I haven't finished it. But um, I've been really into like witch books. Like I don't have it right here. Like there's this one book that I picked up called The Witch's Book of Self Care, and it's all like how to make like bath bombs and like body scrubs and like lotions and stuff like that so i've been doing that and it's been really fun that's pretty cool that way you can like um mix and match like scents and things that you like and Mm -hmm. that you what you would you know what's going onto your body and such yeah exactly um i didn't know that you could just like make your own lotion so i've been like having fun like mixing all this stuff and like making different flavors. I made like a gingerbread like face scrub and then I made like a rose one and then I made a lemon one. Yeah, it's fun. So 
highly recommend <laughs> in your free time if you ever have any. <laughs> Hmm, I wonder if I'll have free time. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully 2021 will bring us more free time. Right? Oh I read um, Ready Player One, and I really liked that a lot. Um, it's really, it, I feel mm -hmm. like it's really different from, like, the movie. The movie was good totally in itself. Different. Yeah. But, um, the book is really great. And, yeah. like, I know that the sequel came out, and but it has really mixed reviews, so... And a friend of mine was like, don't read it. So I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I was really satisfied with the first book. So mm -hmm. maybe I won't read the second one for now. Aw. I also loved Ready Player One. I loved all of the, like, nostalgia and all the 80s references and, like, yeah. just the depth it went into. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was so good. So when the movie came out, I didn't really... I didn't like it as much because they cut out so much. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like yeah, the other, like, they don't really um, grow. Like, none of the other characters grow. They're just kind of there. Yeah. And I was really upset when, uh, about, like, Artemis. I thought in the book she is, she was so strong and amazing. And she was very much for um, uh, winning the game for herself, mm -hmm. for her own goals. Where in the movie she was just kind of like, well, you are the chosen one. You go do the thing. And I'm like, yeah. why did they do that? <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, I didn't love that choice either. The movie, I was just like, oh. And then the last shot, just them just like making out. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Really? I was like, I get it, Hollywood, but ugh. Yeah, it was just, it like fell really flat for me. The only thing I did really like about the movie was like the the way they showed the stacks like oh, that was crazy. the visual of seeing it I thought that was really cool I liked how they did that mm. but that's about it <laughs> <laughs> but I do have ready player two I haven't read it yet it was a Christmas gift so I don't know I'm gonna give it a yeah. shot I'm gonna see and I'm gonna hope that I like it because I love the first one <laughs> yeah, I hope so too <laughs> mainly because well I read Armada and I wasn't a fan of it oh okay it was like the same author and yeah. that was like in a different it's in a different universe but yeah it wasn't the best <laughs> well maybe we should reconvene after we've read ready player two and we can just <laughs> we'll be our next zoom book hang <laughs> a book club that'd be so cute <laughs> Cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on my channel. It was so great to chat. Thanks for having me. This was really fun. Yeah. Uh, where can we find you online? Find me at uh, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at It's Xanthor. Nice. Cool. Thank you guys for sticking around. If you liked this video, subscribe. There will be many more. And I hope you guys have a great day. Bye. Bye.